so super quick one to, today. Uh, so I'm rushing through a bit. Don't forget to email me here when you if you want the slides as soon as possible, uh, and I'll send them to you. Okay, just uh, going to have a little chunk on the budget. A few other things. This TFL did uh, twenty green women uh, at Signals for International Women's Day. Uh, we're not doing an International Women's Day thing today because it's the day after. Uh, again, remind you of that report last week and this week, Top Court confirms UK's broken air pollution law. Um, the ruling came from a European court, but the pollution limits uh, for the UK are still the original ones um, for when we were in the EU, so we're still bound by, the, by those rules. Um, here's a nice thread from John Burke about uh, something I've been going on about for a while that the lockdown shows that we need a lot of green space. We can't get it just from uh, parks and green space. So he, as he says, we need to bring parks to the people, not people to the parks. So he's talked about taking out a load of uh, parking spaces in London, 1.5 million, and the capital cost would be £6 billion. However, it would get that back, uh, uh, that money bank because of uh, the generation of economic activity. So go to John Burke's thread. Uh, now, here's a rather worrying story in the current local transport today that all experimental traffic order schemes may be affected by a judicial review, which is coming up. Uh, so um, we don't know what, I, I don't know if the JR has actually been uh, given leave to appeal, uh, uh, be, sorry, been given leave to uh, go under ju do judicial review, um, and of course what will happen if it does, but uh, something to keep our eyes open on. Uh, okay, so the budget, as you know, uh, was pretty bad in terms of um, how uh, the fuel tax accelerator was frozen yet again, 11th year in a row. Uh, conservative think tank uh, uh, Bright Blue attacked that. Don't forget that fuel duty free has increased UK CO2 emissions by up to 5%, so it's worrying. Uh, John Burke criticizes the Labour Party's support for the 11th annual fuel duty freeze, which, quote, actively encourages short distance driving and SUV sales is completely inconsistent with a sixth carbon budget, global warming denial by any other name, dreadful, weak and visionless. So he's criticizing the Labour Party for not opposing that part of the budget. Uh, and also a very strong criticism from Cycling UK. Uh, Sarah Mitchell, the new chief exec, says complete disregard for cycling's role in the this future is a complete failure to make good on this government's plans to build back better. I'm worried about the how whether the original £2 uh, billion pounds is actually going to be made available over the next three years uh, up to 2025. So read through all that, I've got to rush through. Um, however, the, it may not be as bad as all that because of the leveling up fund. And that says in here that transport investments, uh, including but not limited to public transport and active travel, you can be bid for. Uh, and there can be investments in new or existing cycling provision. Interestingly, note, note three there, all cycling proposals should follow the government cycling design guidance, which sets out the standards required if schemes are to receive funding. That's LTN 120. So it might not be as bad as we thought from first look. Can I uh, jump in? Uh, who wants to say something? Somebody say? No? 
Okay, outside of London. Oh, sorry, apologies, my phone is messing up. Um, yeah, it's Adam Reynolds. I just wanted to say that the priority of your council is also important in your scoring system for this. So you have a series of priority one, two, and three um, for the uh, leveling up fund. And the scoring system also um, favors active travel um, uh, thing, uh, things. Uh, so what you'll find is that if you have a priority two or three council, your yeah. own likelihood of getting funded uh, from leveling up is if you go for active travel schemes. The, the priority one um, category, they are likely to get brownfield redevelopment and things like that. But if you as a if you're a priority two, or if you're in a priority two or three category um, council, you need to get on on board with them and start pushing the fact that if they want to get because it's a it's a comp competitive uh, fund, so if they want to get good scores, they're going to have to be put in active travel schemes. Okay. Can I just Excellent. point out, Adam, Adam, on this that the MPs are being given a veto. If you read through the detail, that all the bids have to have the approval of the local MPs. Okay, um, which is a constitutional change. Righty ho. I'll put that in. Um, uh, report by Possible and uh, by Kids Best. Outside of London, on average, there is fewer than one school street closure per local authority in England. Uh, and don't forget the about 300 in London, but not so many outside. And we know about the problems with uh, cameras and uh, Part 6 Traffic Management Act 2004. Uh, here's a nice uh, little before and after of Old Bethnal Green Road from a site called Bethnal Clean. Uh, that's from Filtermore Streets, and that's a nice before and after. Uh, also, good videos uh, from John Stone in London um, on YouTube. He does those quite professionally, and they're worthwhile looking at. Um, Okay, yeah, must read on LTNs. I've mentioned this before, but um, LCC has done a nice little summary of the research by Professor Rachel Aldred and her colleagues, uh, originally shown up in the Guardian uh, article with um, interactive graphics and found here and here. So they're gonna be necessary for your uh, evidence. Um, things to do, uh, use of AMPR by police survey, I think that's still live, uh, shown that before, that before. Um, yeah, a uh, nice thread from Chris Kenyon uh, laying into the uh, spectators, editor, the wife of Dominic Cummings on a bit of stupid journalism about LTNs. Uh, this is new, Laura Laker about West Mid's police. Uh, don't forget the Phil Goodwin article, very, uh, which, which is new. Um, uh, Matthew Panchars, a former deputy mayor under Boris Johnson, uh, giving the thumbs up to low traffic neighborhoods. Um, there's a webinar for those of you in Manchester, Manchester on Monday the 15th. It's new. Uh, don't forget the Peter Walker book and my review of it. Transport. Uh, Action Network, um, Action Vision Zero and what police are doing in your area, and uh, Joe Dunkley's article uh, about targets, um, Kat Swanson, dreadful uh, bit of road safety propaganda, ranty, um, SUVs uh, cancelling out any gains from electric vehicles, the Institute of Government's uh, report, which got on the front of LTT on what's wrong with bump transport. Um, this is new uh, from Road CC. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, and Phil Goodwin's piece on Grant Shapps's walking and cycling target is essential. Anything by John Bart Burke, uh, DFT's. Um, at rapid evidence assessment and that the others I've mentioned before. Diversity issues, what's new is uh, the uh, series of panel discussions run by Landor, 
here's a very new one, uh, The Right to Lurk or Loiter my, by Make Space for Girls. Uh, what happens when girls decide, design things like swings? If you're a woman, do go to Cycling UK's uh, Women and Wellbeing Survey and the rest you've seen before. Uh, delay slide, nothing new, still the same old thing I flag up every week. Uh, in London, yeah, same old reminding you of uh, the outcome of the judicial review, uh, TfL being given leave to appeal and uh, they're cracking on, Daily Mail doesn't like it. Um, yes, news from today, 350 school streets have been delivered across London in the last 12 months. But do remember that's only at about uh, one and a bit percent of all the school, uh, sorry, ten, about 11 percent of all the uh, schools in London. And the claim is they've reduced ni nitrogen dioxide by up to 23% during morning drop off. 81% of parents and carers supported the measures at their kids' school, and 18% of parents reported driving to school less. Mind you, you know, that's uh, subject to the usual qualifications about surveys, but uh, it's a hell of a lot better than everywhere else in England. And that's something. Uh, there's uh, the survey work done. It was did involve the Fédération Internationale d'Automobile, International Car Federation, who are old enemies of mine with regard to road danger reduction. But uh, so be a bit careful about anything they're involved with. Uh, wonder why they have been giving some support to school streets. But that's just me being a bit kind of super wary. Uh, okay, also following action by Caroline Russell, Green member of London Assembly, 261 junctions in London get signals for pedestrians, but the timetable's quite slow, it's only by 2030. Uh, Camden uh, mentioned that Gower Street went two way uh, last, Sunday before last. Um, and they've been, it's quite interesting when you cycle around there because they've got marshals up there to remind people to look both ways and they've also put cardboard cutouts out there as well, um, which you need for obvious reasons for when you go to two-way working. Um, as a uh, stage one monitoring report of the Railton low traffic neighborhood in Lambeth, and there's uh, the, the lead councillor Claire Holland, and with what looks like quite good results, car traffic down 31%, HGVs down across the area, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's quite good from Relton to LTN in Lambeth. Um, in Hackney, 41 primary school streets have got uh, measures uh, to uh, school streets, et cetera. Uh, so um, that's about, you know, four times the London average, which is good. Uh, so all the others should be doing it as well. And Kensington Chelsea, um, here's a survey done by TfL uh, showing in general support for protected cycle lanes on Kensington High Street, which has been fought over for ages. Uh, Waltham Forest, two new many LTNs. And there's a photo because they claim that the sunsets are better in Waltham Forest because of the LTNs and the Mini Holland. Uh, there's Kingston Station Cycle Hub opens with loads of parking spaces, including non-standard bikes, advanced CCTV, and a new cycle walk bridge nearby. So that's good from Kingston. Uh, just show Chris Kenyon's nice photos of uh, LTNs um, from last week. And, uh, just a one little bit of extra stuff on the subject of children's independent mobility. Um, Graham Paul Smith, I don't know if Graham is here tonight, he normally is. And he sent me some nice photos from of him in the 1960s, uh, showing about how, how kids were allowed independent mobility. He was in his local Birmingham uh, CTC section. And there's him in Buxton receiving a, a CTC certificate. 
I love that photo. There's typical old council uh, uh, bloke who's uh, got his hands behind his back. There's the mayor. Here's the CTC man with his shorts, air tech shirt, and uh, the other chaps have all got their ties on, of course. And there's Graham getting a certificate. And he reported that uh, he used to cycle regularly 100 mile days. Um, so the kids were not allowed just out. They were allowed quite a long way out. And there's Graham enjoying a sandwich in the Brecon Beatons. Note the plimsolls. So no fancy kit for him. Yes, that's the way it used to be. Okay, so that was my super quick um, run through and I missed out some curb nerdery. You'll get it next week. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, any questions, point of order for Bob? I think we picked them up as we went through. When, uh, go on, Mark, I can see your hand. I just wanted to do an update from Brighton because I didn't manage to get it. So work has started. Madeira Drive, which people would maybe not remember, is the, was the first scheme in the whole country um, put in at the start of COVID. And work has started on, well, a week ago, on week on Monday, to actually put in a two-way cycle track along the, I haven't got any photos as such. And the, so, and the school that my son, both my sons went to in the background there has had the first proper recent modal filter in Brighton. You can see it put it in. And we've had uh, all sorts of protests and um, locals, including posters written by children in the windows saying school streets create danger and school streets create pr um, pollution. And I was thinking about reporting parents for child abuse and um, brainwashing, but I was persuaded not to do that. OK, um, well, we'll crack on then. Sally, are you are you ready? We've got a lot to yeah, get through today. I'm so. here. Yeah. Yes. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. All right, can you see that? Yeah, you're all good. Okay, good. Um, I tweeted this article that I'd found. Um, it dates from, I think it's around about 1970, mm, something, I can't remember now, early 70s, I think, um, this week. And um, partly because it was just astonishing how how kind of, it could have just been written today. Um, not just in the kind of what, what it was talking about in terms of street closures, but in the way it's been reported. and the way that an MP has start, is obviously kind of coming in to use it for their own ends. Um, but I'll just read the first bit. It says, MP probes street maze. An MP was yesterday called in to solve the Benwell jigsaw puzzle, but it took Sir William Elliott, uh, MP for Newcastle North, some time to puzzle out how to get into the residence meeting to begin putting together the jigsaw pieces. The cause of this difficulty and that of hundreds of residents in the Benwell general improvement area of Newcastle are eight road barriers put up by the council. They close off many of the streets between some of the roads and the aim is to improve the environment by reducing the amount of through traffic. But it sparked off a massive row. Um, and a number of people kind of retweeted this. I was a bit sort of probably joked about it. But actually, it, it's made me reflect um, on something that I've been sort of thinking about for a while. I'm, I'm researching children and planning in Newcastle in the 60s and 70s. And um, it, it made me think about this, uh, this con idea about context being incredibly important. Um, because you could say, oh, look, this is a fantastic story. If you go into Street View, you can go around those streets and you'll find lots of lovely filters and little parks and, and all the rest of it, street improvements. But actually, um, it's actually not, it's not a happy story for, for, for many people who lived in that part of, of Newcastle. Uh, and I'm just very going to quickly going to explain why. So this is the area of Newcastle that I'm looking at, the West End. Um, the area in red there is the, is the, the streets where, where these measures were put in. You can see it's quite close to the city centre. This is what the historic street pattern was, the tiny amounts of green space, little park in the middle, little square here, all of the rest of the open space is semi-private or private open space. This is what the streets would have looked like. This is 1960, Benwell, um, steep streets going down to the river, industry at the bottom, you can see the power station in the background there. Uh, 19th century housing, by 1960, it's fallen into quite a bad state of repair. A lot of it's owned by private landlords and rented out uh, there were no indoor toilets, bathrooms, 
what have you, modern facilities. And early 60s, the planning department in Newcastle has big plans for revitalization, wants to not only upgrade this, some of this housing, demolish and, and rebuild some of this housing as well, um, but also wants to make environmental improvements and is thinking about things like parking, children's play and what have you. And these are some of the illustrations from the 1963 development plan. The area hatched here is what was demolished. So when I talk about how it's sensitive, you can start to understand why this might be sensitive um, and why people who live in this part of the city, you know, many of them for decades have had things done to them. Um, and um, the area in red here, you can see some parts of it that we're looking at has some, some of those house, houses have been demolished, most of it still exists. Um, there's an area up at the top here, which also has some filters, which all still exist, but this was interwar housing, so you can see there's very little actually of the original housing left. These streets are in South Benwell, they were demolished, um, this is taken in 2008 and I think they were demolished soon after that, so it's a small Scotswood area, but it's the same part of the city. And this is it, this is the same on the kind of contemporary map. So. When you overlay low traffic neighbourhoods, it looks like a positive story, but actually that's because most of the redeveloped areas were or were designed, you know, designed to kind of filter out traffic. And you can see that most of the existing areas still carry some through traffic, and even those two areas that I've talked about, the one at the top here and this one, where there's quite a lot of filtering, but it's not done in such a way to remove through traffic completely from the area. And these, this is this little area again here, um, you can see how there are more green spaces now, but again, thinking about filtering that properly, you'd have to go back, you know, really there's still loads of rat running traffic. So if you were going to, to improve that, um, you would, you, there's still quite a bit of work to do. And it's kind of complicated by the fact that quite a few filters have already been put in. Um, and you can see a couple of the images here. So, so this green space, that would have been a street that's now been demolished. And, and probably that street was demolished because in the end it was just no, you know, successive governments have failed completely to, to properly deal with housing and provide people with kind of decent housing. And, and, um, and, and so if you're wanting to go into that area and, and yes, in a way it's a success story because also, if you go through Street View and look at these streets, there are people sitting outside, there are kids chalking on the pavements, that there are some things that are successful about it. But if you were to think of it, you know, and go, oh, you, you've got this wonderful low traffic neighborhood, I think people there probably feel differently about it. But that's not to say that there aren't lots of different views. And actually, one of the big pressures on the filtering did come from, from mothers and particularly um, of young children over the decade, over the 60s and the 70s um, to reduce the traffic. So I think when we talk about gentrification, um, I think that it's something that has happened in some places. Uh, it's not definitely, it's quite geographically kind of specific, uh, the, the mechanisms that cause gentrification, they have complicated histories, it's often to do with actual housing, uh, not so much, always street improvements. But historically, they've been partly because of the urban renewal in the 70s, they've been very much associated with that process of gentrification. So in London, particularly, I think that's the case in other parts of the country. These are not areas that have become gentrified, but successive groups of people who live in these areas have been massively let down. So I think, I suppose, um, I was just going to finish there, but I suppose um, what I really wanted to to say is I think when when you were talking about um, our own neighborhoods or, or places we, we need to understand a little bit about what has happened there in the past before we kind of go in and say this is an equitable rollout of something because um, it, the, the history can often be a little bit more complicated than that and to be equitable it isn't just about providing kind of the same things for everybody it's understanding the kind of people's starting point and perhaps the history of what's happened in those places. And it may be that in some places you do need to be a little bit more sensitive about how you go in and, and make these changes. And yes, it's very important to make, you know, to improve streets for people for walking and cycling and particularly, I think, for children. 
um, who live there, but uh, it has to be done in such a way that kind of understands a little bit of that historic context. Okay, thank you. Brilliant, Sally. Uh, can't top that. That's yeah. We're gradually going back in time now, so let's go. Uh, let's go thirty years earlier. Carlton, are you here? Hi there. How's it going? All good. Good. Um, I'm in black and white. Deliberately. Just so you know. Uh, I'm here today to talk about something that I'm sure uh, a whole bunch of you will know, <clears throat> but I, I would like absolutely people's feedback. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that at the end. So people who, who, who know me uh, will know that I do this project with, uh, with John Streetdales on, on Twitter, John Dales. Uh, this is the 1930s uh, Cycleways project, which is what I'm going to talk about today. For anybody who doesn't know, I will whiz through quickly uh, just to explain what we're looking at and uh, what me and John and a whole bunch of other people, including Sustrans, um, including the DFT, excitingly, uh, are going to be doing. So let me just uh, go to there and then bring up my slides. Okay, so there's my Twitter handle and there's John Streetdales. And remember that picture there, uh, because that picture becomes important uh, towards the end, that particular uh, cycleway. So this uh, project, uh, I've been doing it since 2017, originally a Kickstarter project. Uh, I now have, after uh, working on the Ministry of Transport, the modern uh, equivalent of the Ministry of Transport, uh, that is, of course, the DFT, I've been trying to get them to buy in to this project since, since those early days. And I've been to the Ministry of Transport, the DFT, uh, HQ, I stop calling the Ministry of Transport. And, uh, and I've, I've uh, given talks there and tried to interest them and it's never really worked. And now finally, we have buy-in. So buy-in from the Ministry of Transport for uh, a continuation of this uh, project. But we've got to remember, as, as Sally was talking, a few, obviously a few decades afterwards, uh, but there was an enormous amount of cycling was going on in the UK uh, back in the 1920s and 1930s. This is Bedford statistic, 80% modal share in Bedford in, uh, in, in, in 1936. And it shocked the Ministry of Transport. They were, they were completely taken aback by uh, how many people were actually out there uh, cycling. So it's a mass form of transport uh, we're talking about back back then, which is one of the reasons why they, they built these, these uh, protected Dutch style uh, cycleways. So that's York, of course, still ish a cycling city. Uh, that's Baron Furness, which is, well, I'm guessing all the people there uh, will be now um, driving uh, to the various uh, factories that are there. But back in the day, cycling place. So uh, what the Ministry of Transport wanted, and this was 1934, this is the, the Amsterdam Harlem Road. Uh, this was a 3.3 meter uh, protected cycleway and the Brits wanted that. So this was a, a photograph in the Times. The Ministry of Transport wrote to his equivalent in the Rijk Waterstaat. Anybody who's a Dutch speaker will, will tell me if I've got that correct. The Ministry of Infrastructure, basically in the Netherlands and, and said, uh, can we have some of that? The, the equivalent to the chief engineer sent all of the illustrations on how to go Dutch. So we were going Dutch or the Ministry of Transport was going Dutch in February 1934. Amazingly, in February, and that's, that's February, by May, the Ministry of Transport had built this. And if I move away slightly, I will go that way, track for pedal cyclists only. So this is in Ealing. They built this one mile experimental uh, cycleway. It was rubbish. It was terrible. It cracked. It, it just, it wasn't very good. So the CTC, the Cyclist Touring Club, Cycling UK of the day, absolutely hated uh, this, this particular cycle track. Um, and then all of their, their, their opinions after that were all based on this very, very flaky, very, very poor track. In fact, the Ministry of Transport built some excellent ones. And we know that because, well, they're still here in many cases. And they were uh, for cyclists only, uh, separated. And the best ones were nine foot wide. And there's um, loads of them. Uh, so an awful lot in London, an awful lot in my neck of the woods and Sally's neck of the woods in uh, Newcastle, a few in Scotland, couple in Wales, 
and well, one perhaps two in, in Northern Ireland. They were pretty good in, in parts. So this is Mickleham uh, in, in, in South uh, East England. And you can see the cyclists there. Well, I can actually do a, a pointer. Can you see the cyclists up here along the trail there? Um, we can't see them on that side, but they're certainly on, on this side. Uh, good to see the, the cyclists on that brand new um, bypass with nine foot wide uh, cycleway. And cyclists were definitely using it because that's the same uh, cycleway, concrete, nine foot wide. Uh, you can't see the footpath there, but uh, there was a footpath too. And this is the same bit of infrastructure. And again, it's, it looks pretty darn good. And it is still there. That is still there. So that's what me and John are trying to do. We are trying to resurrect uh, an awful lot of these, these cycleways, which have been, in many cases, completely obscured. This one exists, but you wouldn't know it exists. It's, you know, it's just a tiny sliver of, 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 of concrete. You can now see it's poking through the grass, but it's still there. Uh, they're so good, some of them. This, was, this is actually a, a still from Google Street View, and the Google Street View ca camera car actually went down that. So that's not my photograph, that's Google Street Car uh, photograph. So the car assumed that was a service road. In fact, it was a 19, nine foot uh, wide 1930 separated cycleway. Some of them were very long, so this was the, uh, we can't resurrect this one, uh, this one's, this one's, even though there's, there's bits of it still there, uh, the South End Arterial Road, it was 15 miles wide, uh, uh, 15 miles, sorry, not wide, 15 miles long uh, back in the day, and you can see cycle track on, on both sides. Uh, and this is St. Helier in London, and this is what it looks like today. So it's still there, but there's cars parking on it, it's been, uh, it's been mucked up basically. So some of these cycleways we can't bring back because there's just too much clutter there now. Uh, others we will be able to bring back. And certainly the ones that are buried, this is a John Stevenson shot of a one uh, near Cambridge, is, is, is quickly fading out of, uh, out of memory. And we could certainly try and bring some of uh, those back. This is the one that I, I put on my uh, Kickstarter project back in the day. Uh, this is in Lostock Road. In, in Manchester. Anybody on uh, from, from Manchester will know uh, that particular one. There's been bollards put in just recently to try and get motorists off uh, here, because uh, there's the, the cycleway as it is today, and, and motorists are parking their cars on it. Again, they, they just assume it's, it's uh, infrastructure built for them. It's not. It's infrastructure built for cyclists, and it was both sides uh, of the road there. And we have had it on TV a few times to try and uh, make at least one side of the road into, into a, a usable cycleway. Uh, the photograph that's behind me uh, is uh, in Neville's Cross, in, in just outside Durham. And that was the A1, that was the Great North Road. And it had cycleways right next to it. And they were both uh, sides of the road. So you can see there, that's actually my daughter on a Brompton there. There's a cycleway there, nine foot wide concrete and across the other side of the road, uh, also uh, the same. And the surface was okay. You know, it's period surface. So that hasn't, the road has been resurfaced with tarmac. The concrete has not been resurfaced uh, since 1937, except it now has been resurfaced and, and renovated and uh, repaired. So there are the guys from Durham uh, County Council repairing it. And there they are resurfacing it and uh, neatly, Back in the day, it was a white elephant. It was just, it didn't really go anywhere, that particular uh, cycleway. Now there's a housing estate. So there's every reason that this particular cycleway will be used because it's going from somewhere now to, to, to somewhere. And, and there it is again. So that's the, what the cycleway looks like now. So it might not be to absolute exact modern standards, but if you were just to look at that particular cycleway, it looks modern, and it's not. It dates to 1937. So what uh, me and John Streetdales are doing is trying to bring uh, an awful lot of these things back. So the, the, what we're, we're going to do is what we just announced is that the Ministry of Transport, the DFT of today, uh, now wants to support us. So the first thing we are going to be doing, me and John, is we are accepting anybody to tell us the bits of, of former 1930 cycleways. And if you want to see where one in your area, just go to bike boom info uh, forward slash 1930s. There's a map on there. You can click in to, to get your particular 
local stretch if you've got one, hopefully. Uh, but what we want people to do is actually tell us uh, which ones do they think could actually be genuinely resurrected. So we've got a long list of projects which we're going to narrow down into a short list. We'll probably pick about in the end 10. 10 will get professionally uh, designed by John and his team. That will be then be presented to local authorities and we hope to then bring those 10 back to life, mesh them into modern uh, networks, and then treat that as um, something that other local authorities can then do for themselves. So this is like an experimental. So we've got the, the money to do six months worth of experiments. So please get in touch on Twitter, uh, DM me, my DMs are open, and, and give me your ideas on any of those 1930 cycleways that you would like or you think uh, would definitely be worthwhile uh, bringing back to life. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Colt. And then uh, and we're all admiring your slick presentation skills there. That's a uh, good uh, media stuff coming. I'm just going to allow a couple of questions because we've got another big talk to come up. So I'm going to go with uh, Andy Hadley. I don't know what to do, Megan. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Carlton, it's a great, great project. I can remember going around the, the Oxford Ring Road, and I suspect that's one. Um, but uh, um, my, my, my worry, I suppose, is, is part of what you're saying about how some of these things have been reused, but also where there maybe aren't the routes that we want to go now. But also with Highways England spending so much on major roads, we should be applying this technology or this, this, this thinking to every major road. I struggle to get, you know, um, 20 miles from here. There's nothing, nothing in my, on, on your map, nothing in the south coast, in the middle of the south coast. Um, but having, um, having the ability to go 20 miles on a bike or an e-bike um, to in my most local centres, they're dangerous fast roads with no pavement and you know it's really not nice. So great project, but I wish it was um, everywhere rather than just where the 1930s were. Thank you. Right, so yeah, more of a comment there, but I'll uh, bring Megan in. Megan? Um, I was just wondering for the long list, um, especially because you're thinking of eventually going out to local authorities, have you given them a heads up um, so that it, a, a lot still have their LC whips in draft development to make sure that they are thinking about, okay, well, how will these fit into the wider network if we get DFT money and, and they make it onto the short list? Uh, we, we have uh, a list of, we weren't working with the willing. So we definitely have a, a bunch of local authorities who we've already talked to who are interested and, and could use uh, LC whip to, uh, monies to, to, to do this with. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that we're, we're the, there's others that wouldn't also come on board. So we want to, to encourage the, a, a, as long a long list as possible, even though we've got a fairly good idea of the ones who we know are gagging for it. All right. Um, well, anybody who's got any suggestions, put them in the chat. I'm, I'm hoping Carlton will stay around to answer a few there, but we're going to going to roll on to the next bit now because we're going even further back in time uh, when we last met Robert Huxford we we're somewhere in the 17th century I'm hoping he's going to take us from there slightly further on today how are we doing Robert are you there yeah <clears throat> uh, can you hear me have I have I, I switched the mic on and your slides are up that's fantastic that's well um uh, Dr. David Harrison is with me again um, this evening, and uh, he's uh, been educating me. So um, last time, well, we, we got up to almost the Black Death. And um, today, there's going to be a sort of 300 year gap. And then we, we're going to try and take it up to the, the very start of the railway age, which is a, um, it's a sort of natural pause. Um, you may alternatively wish that we pause a lot sooner, say at 1601. Um, Anyway, that's what we're going to try to address today. And um, moving the first slide on, here we go. Um, just as a recap, um, uh, Chris Martin reminded me of this very kindly. Um, there's a, the map that's been generated um, of street widths in London, or at least streets beyond 11 meters. So I, I think what, one of the things we're trying to get is a, an idea of the, why things were designed in the way they were, why, why were they specified to a certain width? Um, and in the first part, we, we talked about the medieval and Roman roads and they form much of the arterial network. 
And in the subsequent uh, centuries, we're sort of up to a point filling in the gaps between them um, and maybe improving them. Um, so um, I'll just interrupt there, Robert. Oh, yes. To, uh, to say that, that the, the role of the Roman roads in, uh, in the medieval and later system has been grossly overestimated and just leave it there. Most of the roads um, in use in the Middle Ages were um, created with non-Roman, but obviously there are some examples of Roman roads. Please, carry on. Right, well, they, there we have the, the Black Death, and as you can see, the, um, it's, it's 1347, and the last outbreak of Yosina Pestis um, was 1679. That's over 300 years. Um, it's tend to thought, be thought of as just a, um, a sort of one-off. Um, but it wasn't. The, the population was held down for a long, long period of time. And um, I think, David, you were saying that, that there were pretty much no new bridges that were built during that time. Yes, whether that was due to the Black Death, I don't know. No bridges in new on new sites, and very yes, no new. I leave it at that. And there were no new towns either. So wh whereas the thirteen thirteenth uh, century for uh, and the early part of the fourteenth century, we've seen lots of new towns being created. Um, for the next three hundred years, there is pretty much nothing, nothing at all. Um, so let's let's move on. Um, so we've got a scientific revolution that that happens. Um, uh, so people people are, are not idle. But while they're doing their best to increase the population, um, between that, that that busy occupation, um, some people are, are researching. Um, so we've got uh, <clears throat> surveying methods that are improving. Um, Calculate uh, logarithms being developed by Napier, and um, those are used by surveyors to work out land air areas. Uh, Gunter's, Gunter's chain, um, so making it possible to again survey land in a more accurate sort of way. Um, we've got maps, and uh, David, uh, would you like to say anything about John Speed and his ilk? Um, um, no, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Robert. Okay. Apart from well, saying that this the Saxon maps were commissioned by um, by William Cecil, and with John Ogilby, we get the first detailed surveyed road maps of uh, of Britain, and that's in 1675. The, um, the interesting thing is, of course, it, it's probably Ogilby's Britannia that brings into fashion the word road. Um, before the, the 17th century, it really has scarcely been used. And highway is the word that's used throughout uh, the Middle Ages and the 16th century. And I think Ogilby makes, makes road the, the common term. Well, that's news, news to me. I, I, what, what I think one of the important things about maps is it's a way of looking at the world. And so here we're seeing um, Britain fairly accurately depicted apart from Ireland, which seems a bit strange, um, and town, town plans being developed as well. So this is Northampton, and uh, let's reduce it in size and overlay it uh, on uh, uh, this brilliant website, um, Datashine. This is the um, uh, data on method of travel to work, uh, driving a car or van. And um, as you can see that in the core, um, <clears throat> a lot of people are walking or cycling or using public transport car use to get to work is very very low whereas in the out uh, as you get further away from the center it becomes higher and higher and higher so um there's actually a, an exemplar uh, urban design uh, case of upton here um uh, it's in a sort of dual carriageway box and the car use there is very very high and what must one must conclude that um Having good designed streets is one thing. Um, having the development well located is possibly at least as important, maybe more important in terms of enabling sustainable transport modes. Um, so here's some examples of the uh, John, John Ogilby's, uh, spelt that wrongly, uh, Britannia. And you can see route maps and um, it would be possible to take those uh, and follow a, a route, um, <clears throat> what's this, London to Flamborough, um, this next, oh yes, um, and uh, 
well, it's good enough to navigate. Um, and it, it goes it's on. Very, very interesting. Just if we go back to Ogilvy. Yes. Um, so we have a roadmap, but not de not a not in any way surveyed detailly in a detailed way. But the goth map of uh, of the Middle Ages, which shows uh, many of the routes set out as a sort of itinerary, really. And um, and Ogilvy interestingly follows many of the same routes. So you have great continuity from the 14th century or so through to the 17th century and beyond. I think what's what's good about this is it's good enough to be used for navigational purposes. If you want to go from, um, say, uh, London down to Rye, and I'll illustrate that in just, um, there's enough information there not to get lost. And, and, and previously, you really just had itineraries. And it, it, it continues to this present day. We've got um, uh, David and Emma, uh, Emma Griffin's footways project. Um, yes, and what, what we aim to do there really was to, not only to show um, a network of pedestrian routes largely along back streets um, and using that as a focus for um, infrastructure improvement, but also to see things from the perspective of a, of a pedestrian. You know, geographers go on and on about the, uh, the ideological content of a map. Most maps have been seen as road maps from the point of view of the motor vehicle. What we tried to do here was transform the way we perceive the city as a network for pedestrians. Here's um, <clears throat> a section of Ogilvy's map compared with the um, Ordnance Survey map. It's um, Newenden to Rye. And if we overlay that, oh, note that Rye in uh, Ogilvy's day was a dead end, uh, a cul-de-sac, um, and uh, it's not anymore. Um, well, that that's overlays onto the um, uh, um, micro Microsoft Bing, whatever. Um, you can see it, it, geographically it's a bit messy, but the distances are spot on. I think it's um, uh, just short of 10 miles from Newenden to Rye, and uh, Ogilvy, um, he gives mile readings. Um, it's, um, I think, within within half a mile. So I, maybe he used one of those um, surveyor's wheel things to click along the way in a compass or who knows. So if you're interested, um, do a bit of research and um, let us know. Um, so next section, mud, manure and towns. So um, yes, it was criticism for the previous presentation that um, there wasn't enough sex and violence. Well, we got a bit of violence and we got plenty of mud and filth. Um, so, over to you, David. Well, this is Regensburg, and it, I'm not sure how clear it is, but this pre preserves the sort of medieval style of paving. So most of the major streets in, in, in cities, and certainly a great city like Regensburg or London, would have been paved. You're a learned audience, and you'll realise that uh, the word pave comes from pavir to ram. So what we essentially have here are stones, gravel or cobble rammed uh, into, the, uh, into the street. And you'll also notice no pavement, but with a, uh, you can just about make it out with a central gutter. So the streets will change. So you it, do it, have it, pavements. I mean, the quality of that depends on maintenance. Um, most uh, towns will have some sort of professional paver. Um, and, and cleaning, obviously, is important. So if we could do this in Odorama and uh, uh, throw it back uh, 400, 500 years, it would be pretty smelly and pretty disgusting underfoot. And uh, it's just not civilised. Um, so they had to use things like this. Um, this is from, uh, uh, you can see this in Lewis Castle if you're that interested, but um, it allows them to hop around uh, the muddy service. Well, um, uh, Fashions were in, improving, and here's a chap from 1595 wearing uh, posh clothes and um, uh, shoes. And uh, this lady, rather rather fine shoes. I don't think you could wear those in a muddy street. Nor um, uh, this one. I think late 18th century, isn't it? Um, and uh, there we go. Fancy footwear. Um, it's not compatible with um, a muddy environment. Um, you'll see these sorts of things on. Um, uh, on some older buildings, um, uh, boot scrapers, and there are basically two or three types, 
One is um, blacksmith made and the other one, the cast iron and the, the cast iron ones above, I think they all tended to come out of catalogue. Um, uh, you, you see standard design. So if you get really obsessive with the interest in these sorts of things, you can start to uh, uh, catalogue them. Um, going on, lifestyles are changing as well. So we, we, we're trying to look at the period from 1600 to um, 1826. Um, things are getting uh, fashionable. Okay, at the start of the period, um, we were dealing with witchcraft and witch bottles and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, Queen's House Greenwich, that's pretty trendy. The Arms House is in Elmswell. Um, they don't look that different from, um, well, Victorian era, uh, early Edwardian bungalows. And um, so you've got assemblies, uh, assembly rooms, theatres, and um, if you're rich, you, you probably want to put a, on a bit of a display when you're out in the public realm, and you need um, surfaces to enable you to do that. Um, I, I'm, am I about right, Dr. Harrison, with this? <laughs> so um, uh, new walks were created. Um, this one's in York, um, and there are a number of other towns that. Um, uh, were or cities that were blessed with these things. Um, it says here, uh, mm -hmm. uh, adventures he's seen in prospect as to render it not unlike nor inferior to any of the views in Venice. Um, so we've just thrown yeah, a view yeah. of Venice there uh, for comparison's sake. But the fashion from the reading probably starts with, uh, with Charles in the 17th century with the opening up of St. James's Park as a, as a parade ground and then con continues. But the the 18th century does seem to be the heyday of, uh, of fashionable walking and, and, and strolling. And obviously this is greatly helped as London uh, expands beyond its medieval core and you can build a new fashionable town for people to, uh, with more space and less crowded streets. Here's Newark Leicester, um, 1785. Um, if you if you're in Leicester, do visit this. It's um it's great. It's uh, entirely entirely car free. Well, um, a, a very pleasant environment to be in. And um, 1785, coffee houses. Over to you, David. Well, the, the this uh, old slaughter's coffee house, also known as the coffee house on the pavement. So as we saw in the medieval streets, there were no pavements. Um, as coaches carriages became a uh, a nuisance and probably people had their fashionable shoes that uh, that Robert described uh, pavements come into being the fact that also this is uh, in St Martin's Lane the fact that this is described as the coffee house on the pavement suggests that uh, in the late 17th century pavements were quite rare and before that um, bollards were sometimes used to protect pedestrians from uh, from coaches and uh, and wagons and um, of, the, of the so the, the layout will be very much of the type you might see in Exmouth Market or Lambs Conduit Street with a middle section for vehicles and bollards to protect the pedestrians but at the same level. And uh, I think uh, um, so you increasingly get uh, pavement. And you see this picked up in Scotland. Um, <clears throat> there's been a, a, a well, say the, the come the 18th century. Um, uh, people seeing paving as a way of instilling pride in, in, in the town, pride and sophistication, paving and indeed lighting. Um, and I think that the parishes, I believe that they, they get powers, you can ask for powers to pave, light, yeah. keep and watch streets. Um, that's there, are various, <laughs> there are various acts of parliament in the 18th century. There's the Westminster Paving Commission and the London City Paving, Paving Act. What I like is pave, uh, light, keep and watch. That's four syllables which cover a hell of a lot of things. It's terrific. <laughs> if, if only life were so, so concise these days. Um, so we go to Oxford High Street, J.M. Turner. And um, there we go. There you see it, <clears throat> uh, a curb, uh, flagged footway and a carriageway. And um, it's a, a recurrent pattern. For those interested, maybe, I don't know what date that is. Well, that'll certainly be early 19th century. 1810. That could, that could even be, um, you wouldn't, I don't suppose you'd have York paving getting to Oxford by then. Um, 
and I wouldn't know what to, it must be some sort of local paving material. In, in London, um, Purbeck uh, stone was used in the, uh, in the 18th century before York stone became widely available. And you also see the, 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 the nice paving for the pavement there and the, uh, and the rougher set stroke cobbles for the road. I think, is that right, Robert? That's absolutely right, yes. So we're now going to leave Oxford and <clears throat> look at roads between towns and um, uh, things were not good and various people have uh, wrote about them at the time. Uh, what was this? Arthur Young, he was a surveyor to the board of something or other. Um, uh, I know not in the whole lang range of language terms sufficiently expressive to describe this infernal road. Let me most seriously caution all travellers who may accidentally purpose to travel this terrible country to avoid it as they would the devil. Um, I think he was talking about Wigan. Um, anyway, so 1691, um, there was an act to um, uh, require uh, uh, carriageways, cartways to be expanded to eight foot wide, at least. Um, and maybe that's the sort of thing, uh, not a uh, uh, time academy, but um, just give you an impression what it might have looked like. The, the, the point being that the eight foot, I'm sure, would be the the paved bit. When we say paved, we're probably looking at the application of at this stage of gravel to the uh, to the road surface. As you can say, the actual uh, right of way is is much wider. Yes. And and then of course. In many instances, the um, the diameter, the widths would be far greater when actually built. Eight foot was a minimum, um, and and we're often looking at twenty, forty foot or even wider. So this is quite interesting. The um, the, the the driving forces for the improved roads were really twofold. I mean, were, were manifold, but two particularly important examples are the factors are the uh, the arrival of the large wagon which you can see on the uh, on the left and regular carrying services these uh, produced a great deal of wear on the roads requiring better surfaces and secondly is the uh, is the coach on the top you can see a sort of coach from the first half of the 18th century um, which is which is hung really suspended by uh, from the from the chassis, but only suspended by by leather, and it swings as you go. Um, and then the classic stagecoach, with uh, with steel springs, is what you can see from the early nineteenth century. Is what you see below. But obviously, if you're going to have a coach, it requires a much smoother surface. And the switch from riding on horseback to riding in a coach was a, a large driving force, if you'll excuse the pun, for better roads. Um, the term hell for leather, I heard that somehow originates from the, the, the coach, coaching era. Is, is that true? I've no idea, but it's a lovely idea that, uh, that if in the, in the days before the, the steel spring, you're, um, you're, you're driving at great pace, your coach suspended by leather straps is swinging away. But I've no idea whether that's true, but it's right. a nice thought. Um, what what is true? I, I, you'll note the, um, the the journey times leaves. Is that Shoston? Or oh, I can't read that. Uh, Monday evening arrives in London. Thursday morning. Um, well, the Ebony Design Group tried to get some parcels um, delivered, take, collected from um, uh, London, and taken to Winchester uh, by UPS. And um, well, uh, after a fortnight, they uh, they very kindly brought them back to London, having not delivered them to Winchester. So um, some things don't change at all. Improved, improved roads were, um, were in a sense uh, for the carriage of goods, the, the improvements in the road surface were used to reduce costs by, uh, by fewer horses. And with, with coaches usually to improve times. Though, as you see there, if you look at the, uh, on the previous slide, you had um, more horses on the early 18th century coach and fewer on the 19th century coach. Um, going on to maintenance now, um, and that's the important thing. 
um, to uh, uh, win the war against mud and ruts. Um, so we, we, we start from an era where um, there's a, a general duty on inhabitants. And this is from Gorringe versus Calderdale. If you're interested in um, uh, maintenance liability, that's the, the, the principal precedent. Um, so there's a duty on inhabitants at large to put highways into such repair as to be re reasonably possible for the ordinary traffic of the neighbourhood at all seasons of the year. Um, so uh, it was a, originally a duty on the parish and parishioners had to commit, I think it was, was it six days labour a year? David, can you help me out there? Sounds about right. Sounds about right. Sounds fair. So 1691, um, the parishes are given power, powers to levy rates um, so that parishioners no longer have to turn out for six, six days hard labour, but they can instead pay rates and pay somebody else to do it. Um, there's also a, a, the president of Russell versus the men of Devon. Um, uh, this was about establishing liability. So uh, I, th mm, there I think Russell was some sort of a, a, a coaching accident um, and uh, sued the men of Devon. And it was held that um, there was a sort of uh, a, a crown immunity, statute immunity. Um, so this situation uh, persists <clears throat> until I think the 20th century, pretty much. Um, when you think about highway law, um, you have to think how law has evolved hand in hand with the evolution of highways and traffic. Um, and sometimes, well, in understanding the current law, it, you have to rake over past law. Um, anyway, we're on to turnpikes now. And uh, David, I, can I hand over to you at this yeah. point? So historically, people had used several methods of, uh, of maintaining highways, um, one of which had been raising tolls. These were, this was done in the Middle Ages, but it began to be done systematically in the, in the late 17th century. What the turnpikes involved was not building new roads, uh, except perhaps in, in small sections, but in greatly improving the, the existing roads. It wasn't a matter of uh, new technology, but of applying existing uh, techniques uh, in, a, in a much better way. So the main things they did was simply to improve the surfaces by uh, putting down usually gravel or stones in a systematic and regular way, making sure the ditches on the side of the roads were cleaned. And I suppose the one main change was try and reduce gradients. And, and that was very simple, no new technology. But it did mean that, uh, that for example, a journey by coach to Exeter took um, four days in summer and six days in winter in the 17th century. By 1760, those times had been halved. And by 1820, um, halved again and down to 24 hours. As the, um, as the carriages um, as the surfaces improved, it was possible then to have improvements in the carriages because they could go quicker. So in the 1750s, you get the steel spring replacing the straps. And then in the early 19th century, you get something called the elliptical spring. I've no idea what it does, but it makes for even better, more comfortable journeys. And as I said, with wagons, the main impact is not to reduce journey times, but to reduce costs because with better surfaces, you can have fewer horses and it's the horse fodder um, that is the major cost in, uh, in uh, inland transport at that time. By the, um, throughout the 18th century, the turnpikes are spread out and by the early 19th century, you have a very wide spread and a, ver a fairly dense network. Um <laughs> This next slide is, um, if you recall uh, the 1990s when um, there were ongoing protests about the extension of the M3 by Winchester and um, it was swampy and the Dongas tribe, um, well, I, I think the Donguses were these broadened, uh, uh, a broadening of the way. And I tried to pick that up on a, a LIDAR image. I, I think that's what we're dealing with. Um, it was said, David mentioned the, the road between London and Exeter. Um, so going across Salisbury Plain, it's meant to widen out to um, as much as a quarter of a mile. So I guess 
um, somewhere on the Salisbury Plain, provided it's not been ploughed out, one will see things like this, um, tracks, wheel ruts, um, miniature hollow ways that have been uh, impressed on the landscape. So we have to do the network of fields, um, you have a very defined track. Once you get into sort of upland um, pasture country, um, you might well be able to ramble over a whole area. So um, it's a bit like Randolph Scott leading a, a wagon train across the um, uh, the high Sierras or something like that. Once you, once, you hit, once you hit common pasture, it could be a little bit more like that and the tracks are less clear. Where you have arable land and distinct fields, it's not. Brilliant. And don't be confused by the, um, uh, the, the undulations in the top right hand corner. That is a sewage farm, not, um, not tracks. Um, I think it's quite a Victorian one. A quite a quite a significant um, advance in sanitary science that that particular one. So here we have the um, uh, example of a, from a wonderful website tur turnpikes.org. Um, they've got turnpike maps for all all counties, um, old counties they were, and you can see the um, <clears throat> the ones in London and um, a map of the uh, the gates. So you didn't have to go very far from the centre of London to be hit by um, a gate. Um, and here's the violence. We've got Dick Turpin um, uh, with um, Black Bess um, <clears throat> leaping over a turnpike. It's quite horrifying, that. Do, do you David, do you think they were all fully defended like that, or was that, a, that one a bit extreme? I think that was okay. But of course, it was the area just outside London on uh, Hounslow Heath, where, you know, which was the most dangerous part of the, the country, probably, where the most robberies took place. Hounslow, that was the most frightening part of 18th century England, where you were most likely to be robbed in a coach. Right. <clears throat> um, well, you may see these. Um, so just we were talking about the uh, maintenance responsibility. So here it is put in cast iron. So to the left of the sign, the, the road is the responsibility of the Turnpike Trust. To the right, it's maintained by the parish. Um, so we're now on to bridges. <clears throat> Absolutely. So up to the mid 18th century, England had a network of largely medieval bridges. Um, and the general tendency was that if, you know, if something went wrong, if the bridge arch fell, as you see in the, on the top picture, this is at Harold, um, you could patch it up. And here the responsibility was divided between landowners. And one of the ones who was particularly mean in the middle simply put a plank there. And that plank survived well into the 19th century. So, so patching up was the norm. However, by the late 18th century, a lot more traffic on the roads, um, and you had lots of, uh, of engineers, a change in view, a bit like the 1960s, everybody wanting everything to be modern, you get a transformation, and most of our bridges disappear, as we'll see in the following slides. So this is the, the bridge today. This is one that survived um, at, at Harold. And you can even see where the um, where the arch with the plank had been, I think. Carry on, Robert. There we go. So, um, so what normally happened is that because of the increase in traffic, people wanted wider bridges. So they would summon um, somebody to have, you know, some distinguished almost engineer or bridge expert, as it was, uh, as we're getting by this time. And I think it was Milne who built Blackfriars Bridge, who was summoned to Shrewsbury. And uh, he said, oh dear, your old bridge, you want to widen it? It's not worth the money. I should have said the first thing they'd done even before that was to remove the towers and buildings on the bridge to let traffic go through. All the gateways in London were taken away in about the 1760s. So this is, this is what everybody's doing in the 1760s, moving their gateways. By the 1770s, they think, well, I'd like to widen my bridge. Chap comes along, says, you need a new bridge. It'll be much cheaper in the long run. And so this is what we see. And at this stage, we're getting a not very different bridge, but one given a sort of classical uh, facade, narrow appears, classical facade, no new technology. So we've had this scientific revolution, but it hasn't really had any effect on bridge design. 
and these bridges are built without um, even without without any uh, any piled foundations but 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 still quite effective and still quite a large gradient there are about a dozen um, bridges over the seven at all the places you'd expect the major towns by um by the second decade of the 19th century more or less all have disappeared and been rebuilt if we have the next slide or um, and, and this is one at, at Over. This is part of the, um, the bridge across the Severn floodplain at Gloucester. This is particularly interesting and, and sort of exemplifies the point that, um, that we're not really dealing very much until um, around about this time with, uh, with technical uh, improvements. And in fact, this one didn't really work. This is Telford, who everybody's always very fond of, who's a great uh, showman. What he's doing here is copying a technique, you know, uh, a style used by Perronet in Paris about 50 years earlier. And I think this, this style, I think it's um, where you have this sort of chamfered um, arch, is really just to make it look flatter and more important and, and general, generally flashier and more modern. Um, in fact, it was a failure and the, uh, and the arch slipped as soon as it was built. So it wasn't really a, a great improvement. Carry on. And so the only bit of medieval bridge that survives over the Severn is this a bridge north where Telford was involved again. Um, but the council fortunately didn't have the money to demolish the whole bridge. So they kept, as you can see on the, on the land bank, a couple of medieval arches that were recased and, uh, and some of the piers so this very wide pier on the right hand side um, was, uh, was where the, one of the chapels was. That, that building you see on the top, on the left hand side is reflected in the larger pier which still survives. But this is all that's left of the medieval bridges over the, um, over the Severn. All gone in about 50 years in this extraordinary revolutionary period that can only really be compared with the period after the Second World War in, uh, I think. Shall we carry on? Next slide. And so this shows you the, uh, the destruction and survival. Um, so about 80%, 80 to 90%, I reckon, of bridges standing in 1770 were demolished. Though we still have some very fine examples which we can't go into. So a whole process of modernization. The widening was essential, um, but the demolition wasn't, and it was a matter of fashion. Next slide, please. Um, and this is where you have some widening. This is Harlem Bridge in Salisbury, um, where you can see, as often happens, where the medieval bridge does survive. It's been wide sometimes on, on both sides to make way, really to provide um, opportunities for two vehicles to pass each other. Next one, please. Um, th this is again another example, Bedford, where the civic authorities wanted to, first of all, they removed the buildings on the bridge and the gatehouse, and then they thought they wanted it widened. They brought in an expert. He said, Oh, that's just going to fall down. You need a new bridge. And this is Wing's uh, much wider bridge, which, which in part still survives. Um, but embarrassingly for the, um, for the modernists, so to speak, it was almost impossible to demolish the, uh, the old bridge. And they had to use enormous amounts of explosive to, to finally bring it down. And that may be why most of the other bridges over the, uh, over the Great Ooze have survived. It's after the experience of, of trying to demolish this, they thought, uh, that maybe they didn't need to demolish the old one. Uh, next bridge, please. next picture, please. And last of all, and this is uh, this is saddest. This great arch of old Ouse Bridge, York, with the council chamber next to it. The uh, the great arch bridge was built in the 1560s after the, the central arches had been swept away in a flood. Um, and again, the same process. I think this time it was William Harris who built a vast bridge, Grosvenor Bridge in Chester came along, said, oh, your old bridge is useless, got to pull it down. Um, 
and this is the very beginnings of the uh, of the preservation movement. So John Carter, who was a great uh, conservationist, member of the Antiquaries, said, "You don't need to demolish this." He said, "You only want to demolish it because you want to get to the race course a bit more quickly." Complete waste. He said, "Keep the old bridge in all its beauty and build two bypass bridges." The city authorities refused. They demolished the wonderful bridge. Uh, and then a few years later, also built the two bypass bridges. Uh, but also this period, as you can see, you're getting a lot more bridges. The main roads have been largely, uh, largely built, um, largely bridged in the Middle Ages, and that continues. Um, but over either new roads or less important roads, you're getting a whole new network and many more bridges from the period. Next slide, please. Or perhaps this is over to you, Robert. Ah, oh, <coughs> so the last and greatest bridge, uh, Waterloo Bridge, designed by Rennie, um, opened in 1817. And this is the first really uh, modern bridge over the Thames in London. Uh, so what happened here was that finally new technology and scientific methods have applied. It had never been possible to build a bridge in a copper dam in the Thames before because of the, the leaky gravel and the tides. So old medieval London Bridge was founded on, uh, on this strange system called Starlings, which I won't go into in detail. Um, and, uh, and all the new bridges, Blackfriars, <laughs> Westminster, etc., were built on caissons where the base for the piers was simply sunk onto the river floor. They didn't last very long. Um, and so Rennie built this, uh, this wonderful bridge um, for various hydro, for various reasons in the 1930s, um, it began to subside in one or two places. It could have been saved, but Herbert Morrison was absolutely determined to demolish it and build the, build the present bridge. And we lost one of our finest bridges. The new scientific methods that were applied were the use of a steam engine to take the water out of the copper dam and sheet piles to make sure that uh, the copper dam was really secure. This was then also applied to Rennie's London Bridge of 1831, which replaced the medieval bridge. And it, it astonishes me to think that actually that bridge was demolished in the 1970s. It was extraordinary, it lasted so long. It's such a great monument, and it was still willing to destroy it. So there we have the, uh, the story of bridges and, uh, and I suppose London Bridge and Rochester Bridge were the two medieval bridges that had to be demolished because the cost of maintenance was huge and by the 19th century there were ways of, uh, of building um, great estuarine bridges. Thank you Robert. Right, Onwards. thank you. <laughs> well we're on to, um, uh, so we've covered turnpikes, that, those are the main roads, then um, in, in the 17th, 18th century, um, there was a period of, uh, in the, the central section of England, you see that uh, England dispersion scores, uh, roughly running from, uh, say, Dorset, through Hampshire, uh, through Warwickshire, Oxfordshire, um, up on into Yorkshire, um, that's a zone of the countryside where uh, the prevailing settlement pattern is of nucleated villages surrounded by great great field systems, open fields, whereas to the northwest and the southeast, um, the settlement pattern is very much more uh, dispersed and it, it's a different sort of organization, a different sort of agriculture. Um, and in this, uh, in this period of enclosures, um, the, the, the fields and the pastures were being carved up and reallocated. New surveyed fields were being created. Um, uh, so you see rectilinear boundaries, and in many instances, new new roads were created as well. So these are roads that run between villages, um, rather than the um, it, first and foremost, rather than the, the roads that run between market towns. Although it would have included uh, you know, the, the surveying techniques, in in some instances, would have included um, realigning those those main roads. So here's an example from um, uh, this is in Derbyshire. I was hoping Kate Carpenter would be would have been here to be able to comment on the respective uh, road safety of these different era uh, and different 
design road. So I mean, these are pretty much laser straight. Um, uh, and here are some examples of dimensions. So uh, 40, 45, 50 feet seem to be fairly standard in Somerset, a lot of 40 foot um, with 12 foot uh, 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 metal carriageway. Um, and the extremes seem to be, uh, um, well, uh, Norton Chai across 33 yards, 22 yards. These are uh, figures from uh, Hoskins, um, uh, if you uh, want to follow this, <clears throat> follow this up any further. Um, so those are the, um, uh, the sort of secondary and minor, minor roads. Um, uh, and you'll, you'll see these in the central section of the, of the countryside, rather than in places like Kent and Surrey or um, Chester and Lancashire or Exeter and Cornwall, where winding narrow lanes are going to be commonplace and uh, predominant. So now we come to um, the in, into towns and we're, we're on our home stretch now. Um, so following this <clears throat> um, suppression of the population caused by the Black Death, uh, ague and all sorts of other horrible things, um, warfare, um, we have a planned town at Derry, London Derry, and <clears throat> it's got a, a central square, um, about 200 foot. The, the streets on either side seems to be 60 and 40 foot. Um, and there you can see a, a Google Street View image. Um, well, <clears throat> then in, in London, Bloomsbury, um, Bloomsbury Square, 1725. Um, David, would you like to say anything about Bedford Square? Well, you've got the information there about the very broad pavements, nine foot six inches. Wouldn't we love broad pavements like that? Um, and the other interesting point which you put in there is it's a very early use of, of York paving stone, um, which would have been very expensive to bring down as it would have to come by uh, shipped. And really, York paving stone becomes much more used once you've got the uh, railways. Um, and of course, here you have uh, this uh, these delightful residential quarters, often designed as a whole complex with with different grades of of housing and different types of dwellings, all close to uh, all close together. And in fact, this is also not very far away from the uh, the slums of uh, of St Giles, but you do have to have a market in the development. And uh, and houses nearby for other uh, other tradesmen, um, and and the other thing to be said is how beautifully, how wonderfully, this and Fitzroy Square have been um, have been improved as a piece of public realm by Camden Council. What an extraordinary contrast that is between Grosvenor Square or Manchester Square or Cavendish Square over in Westminster or Portman Square that really need the same, the same treatment. I won't say anything now, but there's a whole story of, of 18th century low traffic neighbourhoods that begs to be told at some point. Um, carry on, Robert. Carry on. Of course, we're, we're dealing with design for the rich. And um, if there's a, um, a, a part three talk, um, when we will be talking about the Victorian period, um, we'll be talking about design very much for the poor and the disadvantaged um, and dealing with gross public health problems um, and poverty. Anyway, so we get over to the um, United States. Um, well, they weren't, uh, were they United States at the time? No, they weren't. Um, the um, uh, Savannah Plan, 75 foot main streets and half that for secondary streets and a quarter of this for lanes with um, interspersed by little squares and in uh, magnify that a bit um it, it uh, was supposedly um laid out on the principles of the enlightenment and um it, it was a, an egalitarian uh community i think they were against slavery um and there you have it built out um with the squares still in place and a um a street view um so you, you have the um the view uh, closed off by the by the um, by the squares, the tree planted squares. It's said to be naturally traffic calmed um, to about twenty miles an hour. Um, See there, the um, the car, the parked cars. Of course, in in eighteenth century London, there were muses, so you you weren't allowed to park your coach 
overnight on the and probably wouldn't want to on the on the carriageway. So you put it in a in a whole series of muses that were built at the back. I suppose a bit like uh, a bit like ten foots in Hull. So on, having mentioned Hull, we're back in England and at Maryport or Ellenfoot, as it used to be called. This is um, in Cumbria, uh, just uh, north of Whitehaven. Um, it was a, a a new planned town. Uh, Act of Parliament, 1749. You've got the highway or the street is 36 foot wide, 36 foot between the building frontages, a 24 foot carriageway, six foot footways. I, I was here checking this with a laser measurer. Um, now, whether there were six foot footways and 24 foot footways in uh, carriageways in 1749, who can say? But um, that is a pattern that is then picked up in the in the Victorian period and subsequently. Um, figures in meters there for people who can't uh, handle feet. Um, and at Edinburgh, um, Central Street, 100 foot, outer streets and cross streets, 80 foot, Mews, 30 foot. Um, and then we can go to New York, um, similar sort of thing, cross uh, the um, main streets, cross town streets, 100 foot, and the east west streets of 60 foot. So I mean, there, are, there seem to be common dimensions that are uh, uh, appearing, and maybe it is about some sort of notion of aesthetics and civic civic pride that's influencing the the, the design of streets and the, the specification. Um, down to um, you, David. We're more, or less, we're more or less at the end. So, as I said earlier, most of the roads. Uh, in England were, were the, had their origins in the Middle Ages. And there wasn't a lot of change really, despite the, the turnpike. So new sections here and there, but essentially they followed the, their earlier course. But there was one great exception connected with the, uh, with the union of, uh, of Britain and, and Ireland. And that was the decision to, a political decision to create a great road from, uh, from London to Ireland by Holyhead. Finally completed in 1826, um, Telford again in, in, in charge of it. 1826, the opening of this uh, magnificent suspension bridge, the, uh, the Menai Straits Bridge. And, uh, and on the bottom left, you see a picture of a refectory pulpit and Shrewsbury Abbey. And uh, in building this road, Telford was so ruthless that he smashed his way through the uh, the medieval cloister, leaving the pulpit uh, stranded as he put, put the road through. The really interesting thing is that, of course, then the railways come. So um, after the Middle Ages, we only have uh, one, uh, one new road built and nothing again until the, nothing then till the 20th century. Um, and as Robert puts on, we're now into the railway age. 1826, I think, is the act, uh, the parliamentary act, rather than the uh, rather than the construction. And you've got all the great works of the Stevens and etc. Robert, over to you. Well, I think that's that's the end. Um, what what I hope hope we what we, we try to do is to explore the reasons for. Um, urban development and for road construction and road maintenance and I, I hope that's been a, a, a value um, and of course it's a, 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 a journey there are many questions that I, I need to ask and answer myself um, we're still trying to learn um, thank you very much for listening and I hope at some stage we can uh, cover the Victorian period um, the public health movement people like Chadwick by law streets and uh, it, it takes us more or less up until the um, the 18 the 1940s um, so there we go uh, back to you um, Mr Deegan thank you for your yeah thanks thank you Robert that was absolutely brilliant and uh, yeah I'm, I'm hoping to speak for everybody we definitely want part three that was a uh, phenomenal and just uh, everybody's been amazing tonight Sally and Carlton and really uh set the tone well so i'm just going to hand over to ruth to do a kind of last word and then we'll wind it up for this week and, and next week i will say michael barrett's here who's like if you ever heard him speak before he's, he's well worth turning up for so we've got a, 
Good week. Over to you then, Ruth. What's the last word? Bow down, bow down to Michael Barrett, star. Uh, I've just put in the chat, so um, with reference to International Women's Week, uh, what I got up to in the last eight days was to cycle 100 miles in eight days, which for me is not that difficult, I have to say. So I did 188. I've raised £1,115 for something called Smart Works, which is um, providing clothes and interview skills for unemployed women so that they may get into work. So I've put the link on there. It's still live. If anyone would like to contribute, donate, that would be fab. And I've had the most lovely time doing it, cycling with different women um, on each day, uh, socially distanced. So brilliant. Thank you.